Hi there, thanks for joining us today for this latest episode of The Green Left Show. Uh, my name is Alex Bainbridge from Green Left and uh, very, it's great to be with you here today. I want to start off by acknowledging that we're recording this show on stolen Aboriginal land. Our sovereignty was never ceded and uh, this remains, always was and always will be Aboriginal land and we pledge ourselves to ongoing support for uh, struggles for justice for Aboriginal people. I also want to let you know at the outset that if you like the work that we do, the best thing you can do is become a Green F supporter, if you're not already. Uh, it's, it's the best way to support our work and it makes a huge difference. Plans start from just $5 a month and you get all the access to the content that we produce as well as showing us support for an invaluable uh, eco-socialist project. Today we're going to be discussing nuclear power and in particular the dubious left-wing arguments against it. I'm here today with Simon Butler. Simon is a former editor of Green Eft, and he's also the co-author with Ian Angus of the book Too Many People? Question mark about the, uh, the, the dubious arguments about overpopulation. So what's prompted this discussion today is that um, Bhaskar Sankara, who's a founding editor of Jacobin magazine, uh, has recently published an article in The Guardian newspaper where he's arguing in favour of nuclear power as a source of supposedly clean energy. He writes that, quote, even where we've been investing in renewable technology, without nuclear or the right geography that allows hydroelectricity, we've had no choice, he says, no choice, but to rely on fossil fuels to fill the gap. I just want to start, Simon, by asking, is this true? No, it's, it's definitely not the case. So he, he does cite some examples such as Germany and the, uh, New York State of where the closure of, of nuclear power plants has led to being replaced by fossil fuel. Um, but that is purely a political decision made by those authorities. Um, so there is, there's the the reason the only that's the only reason why fossil fuels have replaced nuclear in those cases. So I I, I don't agree at all that if there's no choice but to go with with nuclear power um, at all. So nu nu definitely in, in renewables with with the is, is is definitely a uh, uh, an option in all those cases. Your response included 10 reasons for why we should oppose nuclear energy. Do you want to perhaps just start by outlining your top three reasons why we shouldn't, why progressive people shouldn't be supporting nuclear energy? That's hard. I wouldn't even say top. I can, I can, I can look at three, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, but I think it's hard to rank them, isn't it? The first one I would say is that it is reckless in the extreme um, to build new nuclear power plants in a warmer, wilder future. So nuclear power is already unsafe, uh, but it will become even more unsafe as we see extreme weather events associated with climate change, which are already locked in. And we know we haven't actually even seen the worst of those weather events yet. Um, I'm still reeling a little bit, which perhaps you are too, from the, the record temperatures in Canada just now, for example, where the record has been broken by 4.6 degrees Celsius. Um, for the hottest temperature ever recorded in Canada. Normally, temperatures uh, are broken by fractions of a degree, but 4.6 degrees in one hit is absolutely um, frightening. But the, it's, it is so reckless to build power plants. Imagine, I, I put in the article, imagine if a nuclear power plant had been in the way of the wildfires that raged across Australia last year. Or, or imagine if uh, a super, super typhoon uh, flattened the city and there was a nuclear power plant there. So there, there's much talk uh, from advocates of nuclear power that the designs are fail safe now, that they are much safer, um, and that a Chernobyl style meltdown is impossible. But it's critical to remember that in Fukushima, a much newer power plant, the fail safes all worked as intended. However, the power plant was hit by a loss of power, complete loss of power through an unpredictable accident, which meant that they were unable to cool the nuclear, nuclear the, the uranium rods. Um, they, ran, they were unable to pump water there to, to cool it. So even if the reaction stops and the, and the nuclear fuel drops down as intended into a pool of water, if you lose power, you are screwed. Um, and so there's, it is absolutely reckless uh, to build new nuclear power plants when we know there's going to be so much more unpredictable and extreme weather events. So that's number one, it's too dangerous. A second, I'd say <clears throat> it's almost a, a fruit, fruitless argument because nuclear is not renewable or plentiful. 
So to say that nuclear is a climate change, an answer to climate change, a solution to climate change, uh, that we can, uh, is, is this power source which is useful for combating climate change is, is really not true in any sense. It forgets that, we, that uranium is not a plentiful resource. So one, I did do cite one example, one study which has been done, which estimated that if you were to replace 70% of current world energy use with nuclear power plants, you'd run out of uranium in approximately six years' time. If you trebled nuclear power from what it is today in order to fight climate change, supposedly, you'd run out of uranium in, in a couple of decades. So it is no, there is no way that nuclear power can make a big dent in carbon emissions anyway. So it's a quite fruitless uh, to, to, to pose it as, as, as part of the solution. Um, all it does at present is investing nuclear power, plant power is far more expensive than renewable alternatives. So it means diverting uh, resources away um, from the, far, the, the, the kind of energy, the clean energy we can roll out quicker. Thirdly, I'd say it is, it's, it's so rarely discussed by advocates of nuclear power, where does this uranium come from? And the, uh, they never want to talk about it. It just somehow magically appears. But uh, the majority of uranium, which is mined around the world, and the deposits which remain are on indigenous lands. And the nuclear power of nuclear industry has treated indigenous people's culture and indigenous people's lands as a, uh, as a sacrifice zone for its entirety that has been around. And we should not continue its expansion or its continuation. So we need to listen to people like the Mira people in the Northern Territory who have always opposed nuclear mining on their lands from the Ranger Mine, which is fortunately now finally closing, but it's done immense, irre, irre, uh, immense and, and irrecoverable uh, damage uh, to, to the lands there, but also the Jabaluka deposit as well, which has always been a danger that, that can be mined out too. Um, we need to listen to those critics, Indigenous people around the world, who said it's an unfair burden for them to have to be at the front, the front to have to deal with all the, the consequences of uranium mining, and then also be asked to, in some cases, to, to, to host the, the, um, the waste as well. Um, so the people who, uh, people who advocate for uranium mining and for nuclear power want to ignore the environmental racism, which is so closely tied uh, to, to, to the nuclear power industry. And we can know, we, can, we simply should rule that out. Um, continuing that is a great injustice. Do you want to elaborate some of the other arguments that you made about why we shouldn't be supporting nuclear? Sure. I mean, the, the, we know that fresh water use is, or fresh water shortages are, uh, are going to be a big concern in a, in a warmer world, but nuclear power is the most water intensive um, energy source that we have. Um, so it, again, it, it's, it's just very, very bad idea to, to, to roll out more nuclear when fresh water is going to be of such a uh, concern for the future. We need to, to nurture that resource. Um, it's more expensive, as I said, um, so it diverts resources away from not just other energy sources, but from other things that we need to do um, for, for a safe climate, So such as rolling out uh, uh, health care for everyone who needs it, even climate reparations for the global south, which is something we don't discuss enough. That's an essential part of a, of a, of a climate, climate a response, which is meant with climate justice. Um, so nuclear power is, is, is bad for that reason. The nuclear waste issue is there's no solution to nuclear waste. And I was irritated by um, Sankara's argument in, in, in The Guardian that said that there's a new breed of nuclear power which eats its own waste. Um, that's not true. It does not exist. It's a theory only. There is no such nuclear power plants which use its own waste and eat it. So there is no solution to, to nuclear waste. And that's not even, a, it's not just a, a sort of a, a terrible thing to do to our descendants to, to allow them to inherit this problem of, of waste which lasts for, for millions of years in the most, um, in some cases. But it's also a very present problem so, for instance, I report about or refer to the Marshall Islands, where in the 70s, the, after the nuclear weapons test, the US government built a concrete sort of uh, dome over waste in, in a, an island in the Marshall Islands. And this is when Marshall Islands was a colony of, of the US as well. 
Um, they've now they didn't foresee what would happen with climate change, and so this rising sea levels mean that the whole structure may collapse, and that radioactive uh, soil and radioactive contaminated waste is just going to very likely to quite soon um, go out into the into, into the surrounding environment into the lagoon there. And the US has simply just refused to give any assistance either. So it's not even that nuclear waste is some future problem in a lot of places around the world. Um, climate change is going to mean that the, the, the supposedly secure waste repositories will not become secure. So that's another big problem. Finally, one of the, the biggest ones as well is nuclear weapons. Again, I think there was a, a claim made in the Guardian article, which I think is very dangerously wrong, which is that... Uh, People's popular, uh, which is a popular association, um, which is made by people between nuclear power and nuclear weapons, is incorrect. And it is, as uh, Sankara said, it was drawn out of a kind of paranoia associated with sort of the Cold War. Uh, however, the, the, it is what is very clear is that in countries such as Britain and the United States, the authorities and the military and the government themselves draw a clear link between nuclear power, civil nuclear power industry and nuclear weapons. Um, they themselves very openly say that maintaining civil nuclear industry is important for their nuclear weapons programs. And the reason for that is that because every country which has a civil nuclear uh, uh, um, uh, industry has reprocessing plants and has the facilities which you can also use very quickly to make nuclear weapons. You have uh, technicians with the expertise um, to be able to make a transition to nuclear weapons very quickly as well. And so that, and also the fact that the civil nuclear industries in the UK and the US, which are more expensive, which are heavily subsidised by government, because those industries actually subsidise by you know, by sharing the facilities, they subsidise the nuclear weapons industry as well, nuclear weapons programs as well. Every country which has a nuclear, uh, a civil nuclear uh, power industry will have the facilities which means they are able, um, if there is a political, if there is a government so politically inclined, they, they will be able to quickly build a nuclear weapon. And to be honest, it's no secret, that's why there are sections of the Australian ruling class would love to have some more nuclear power plants for that very reason they see it as a military and strategic choice. It has absolutely no, no, no environmental, it's not a savvy green choice. It is, for them, it's a military option. So that's something we should not downplay and, and pretend that that connection doesn't exist. A strong part of Baskar's argument is that in some cases where nuclear power plants have closed down, they haven't necessarily been replaced by renewable energy. So he makes a, he makes a strong argument that in such, in such situations where renewable energy is not available, we should keep nuclear power plants going for... Uh, for you know, until such time as renewable can replace them. Do you think there's any validity in this argument at all? Um, well, I, I would counter that with that there is already renewable energy is sufficiently advanced right now to do the job. So we are in an emergency situation. We need 100% clean, safe and renewable and sustainable energy as soon as possible. Um, so fossil fuels and nuclear need replacing at emergency speed. Um, so there is no, I don't accept that there's a, an option for let's do nuclear, let's do, let's leave nuclear power off future, um, which I think that is, is part of the, the argument that let's, let's keep nuclear for the next few decades. Um, but we need to replace, we need clean, safe, renewable energy immediately or as soon as possible. And there should, I don't accept there's any delay and I don't accept there's any need for technological uh, development in, in, in so solar and wind and other renewable energies. We have known there's been plans available uh, for, for a decade or more well thought out cost of plans for, for transition as countries such, to, such as Australia to 100% renewables. That technology has only got better in the intervening 10 years. So I don't accept that there's any need to wait. Um, we need to do that as soon as possible. Also continuing nuclear power um, means continuing to treat Indigenous people around the world as sacrifice zones. And that, again, that environmental racism, which is aligned with, with the nuclear power energy, we cannot just say that, well, because we have to fight climate change, we're going to screw over the Mirar people or other Indigenous people around the world. That's not acceptable. They've already, uh, they need, they need to, their rights need to be respected too as we transition to a sustainable climate. Well, I was going to ask actually about 
exactly that the the feasibility and the reliability of renewable energy but i mean you've sort of you have covered that uh, i guess one thing to though to go back to Basca's argument he made a big point about renewable energy not being dispatchable in the way that uh, nuclear and hydroelectricity is do you think that's a fair point or could you address could you address that point in particular Yes, I mean, it, it, it definitely is dispatchable. Um, so it's dispatchable through many different ways. Um, there's dispatchable if, if there is hydro available, you can, you can store the water in, in hydro plants um, by pumping the water uphill and then releasing it again later. Um, but it's also dispatchable um, through batteries and there's other ways to dispatch it, such as molten salt. Um, so he makes the argument that batteries or the, the technology is not advanced enough um, to be able to do it. But, you know, for instance, that... Uh, more than 10 years ago, Beyond Zero Emissions in Australia produced a report um, with, you know, produced by people who are engineers and, and people who are experts in the field showing that the technology 10 years ago um, was, was, was there to have dispatchable renewable energy. So it's only, it's, I haven't said anything, I think it's not, it was there 10 years ago, so it's definitely there now. So I just, I think that, unfortunately, this is a problem with the pro-nuclear argument. Unfortunately, that, the, the, the pro-nuclear argument, they always say that it's a choice between nuclear and coal. But in order to make the argument, they always have to downplay the ability of renewables to do the job, which means this is the danger of their argument. The danger is that their arguments reinforce and they dovetail with the argument from climate deniers who also say renewables aren't up to the job. So, for instance, former Australian Prime Minister John Howard, his favourite thing to say, his favourite thing to say was that the sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow every day, and that's why we can't have renewables. And Sankara actually makes a similar argument in his article, which, again, I found very irritating just because we heard that so much from John Howard. Now, the, the point is that the Beyond Zero Emissions and other, other people have made it as well, the sun is always shining somewhere and the wind is always shining somewhere. And so if you have a modern grid and you have, a, if, you, if you match up solar solar resources and wind resources in areas where we know how the weather patterns are, uh, are going to play out, you can, with a great level of certainty, over a large area, um, determine that, yes, we're going to have enough power um, within the ver within, you know, with, with enough redundancy as well um, to, to deal with unexpected um, lack of sunlight or unexpected lack of wind, et cetera. So it's, it's really a myth um, to say that, that the fact that renewable energy is intermittent means that it can't be reliable. Um, those things are well known and well dealt with by people who are, who are experts in this field. Well, there's one other thing I would say though about renewable energy um, too, though, is that there is uh, a kind of uh, there is an eco-modernist version of the renewables argument as well. So the eco-modernist argument is that we it can roll out renewable energy infinitely. And that there's the, the power of the sun and the wind is infinite, and that we just need to build endless wind turbines in the solar panels to replace fossil fuels, and that will solve our problem as well. Um, whereas I don't think that's an acceptable ecological um, outcome either. Um, solar and, and wind, for example, still do rely on, on extraction of resources um, that are not unlimited. Uh, and, and so we need to be very, very careful that we don't, um, that we need to sort of make sure that. That, uh, that, that a transition to renewables is not just seen as another way to continue business as, as usual with, with renewable energy too. There needs to be, as well as that, um, a massive drive on energy efficiency. So overall using less energy. Um, also would mean to rationalise well, what things uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of socially conscious and equitable plan of how do we ensure that, that energy is used in a way which is most efficient, but also which means that everyone, human rights and, and basic rights are met, but we don't waste energy use on superfluous products that we don't need, et cetera. Um, so, but also we've been challenging this notion that we need uh, an economy which grows forever and which energy use increases forever. That is not at all sustainable. And the climate crisis and the wider ecological crisis is proof of that. So it also means that renewable energy is not uh, a panacea. Renewable energy has to be twinned with fundamental social change, has to be twinned with a move away from, from grow or die capitalism into a sort of an eco-socialist kind of society as well. Um, so 
renewable energy is only part of of the solution in that sense in my, in, in my view when addressing climate change i mean it's very clear this is a huge and pressing problem and it's also a very urgent problem and the main enemy the main roadblock standing in the way towards a, a transition to actually deal with it properly is the is the big fossil fuel corporations you know some people might think that it's not appropriate to be getting into debates with others on the left who actually support nuclear power however, however misguided that might be when the main enemy is the fossil fuel corporations do you have any comments you make about that and they are the main enemy um, or they are one of the, the key enemies and so of course uh, most of our energy must be must be put in into into fighting them at the same time um, these debates i think are actually quite clarifying and healthy too um, we need to debate you know, with each with one another, what what kinds of solutions um, are, are useful, and which kinds of solutions are false and lead us in the wrong direction. Particularly the fact that uh, we are heading into a, a we need a, a a more robust and resilient energy system for the future means that dangerous options, race, uh, options which are tied with militarism such as nuclear power, options which are tied with legacy of environmental racism, they are unacceptable in, if we're going to build a, a world with social justice. Um, so I think that, yes, it's certainly the case that um, the, the fossil fuel industry is a much greater threat Im immediately, perhaps, than, than, the, than the nuclear power industry, which is dying. The nuclear power industry is in deep trouble. And I think that the left, people on the left who support the nuclear industry are certainly in a minority and they're not gaining, gaining much um, support either. We still need to debate those things and we need to be very, very clear about that we are not going to allow the world, we're not going to fight climate change by allowing certain parts of the world become sacrifice zones. We're not going to leave some people behind because some people have to deal with the nuclear waste, some people have to deal with the uranium mines, some people have to deal with the accidents that happen, and that's not acceptable either. Well, we're in a situation where this, where the climate emergency is so pressing and so urgent. I mean, are there, are there any other comments that you'd like to make about this issue at all? Um, well, I, I think that there is, there's a lot of great work going on. So it is, it is often, I think it's quite hard, it's quite confronting for those who are paying attention to see things such as Australia's bushfires last year. I was you know, no longer live in Australia, but to see that was absolutely, you know, it was devastating to see that. Um, what, the three billion animals who, who died, for example, and to think that that might become a regular feature of life in Australia is terrifying. Um, and to see that the floods in, in Mozambique three years in a row, massive floods, which people have been displaced. The, 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 the heat wave in Canada just now is another example. So I think the only general comment I would want to sort of emphasise right now, because I think the activists who are campaigning have, have, you know, have uh, uh, are full of ideas and, 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 are, and are not letting up. But the more general point would be that, um, that all of us, I think now, those who are committed to it, even though if we think we're not in a majority, particularly the eco-socialist movement, we've got to make a commitment now that we never, ever, ever give up, uh, that we never, ever give up. Uh, because there's, the things can always, always get a lot worse. And what I do foresee and what I'm a bit concerned about at the moment is that, that, the, that, the, that elements of the ruling class are going to make a switch, a switch from climate denial saying that there's no problem to automatically to jumping straight to saying, well, it's too late to act. And, and, and I think that's already happening in some cases. And, and they're going to make that switch um, and use the, the heart, try to very much to harness the despair and fear um, about climate change and to harness that in, in, in ways which, which uh, blame somebody else, and particularly which blame racial minorities, which blame migrants, um, which try to harness the despair and turn it into hatred. Um, and I think there's elements of that already taking place, particularly in Europe, where you have, for instance, in Denmark, you have a government which is talking, uh, uh, sort of a, a centrist kind of government, which is talking about um, actions on climate change, but is also carrying out um, a very, very racist migration policy and, and very racist towards migrants. You have the potential for a Le Pen government in France who promote themselves as a Green Party now because they're against migrants. And I think um, that there's, a, there's a real danger that that despair 
um, is going the political right is going to can you use that to harness um, to, to make for, for I guess an eco-fascist response to the climate climate crisis as well because um, the, for, for the for the capitalist class they don't really have anywhere to go um, climate change is real it is going to get worse and so that there's you can see why the, 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 the there is elements of the, of the elites already reaching for that kind of thing so things can get worse um, and we are the ones who have a, a, a notion of, of I guess confidence that the capacity of, of ordinary people to change the world for the better. Um, even if we have a world which is wrapped by climate change, nothing is too late that it can't get worse. It's never too late to to build a world based on human solidarity um, and, and to make sure that no matter what happens, that we do our very best to organise a society where we we try we fight for every single life and we fight for all, for all the for, our, for every single species as well. So that would be my general point. It would be never ever give up. We can never ever give up on this. And that prompts me to ask, I guess, two things. I mean, potentially related. One is a question of hope. Like, what do you think is the hope for, uh, for you know, that climate activists can can take in the current situation? And related to that. Uh, some people might think that the ruling why is uh, some people might be questioning why is the ruling class are not taking further action uh why the you know the, the capitalist rulers of the corporations and the governments that they control um surely they're all going to be affected everyone's going to be affected by climate change why aren't they taking more action and, and why can we not expect them to take action hmm. i think i think it's part, partly it's related to the fact that the capitalist capitalism itself is is, is incapable of responding to long-term problems in this way um, so that the way that, that capitalism has already always in the past has dealt with the environmental crises that it that it creates is the, the environmental rifts that capitalism creates is to shift the problem elsewhere um, so capitalism is a is a sort of system of dealing with with you know, the way it relates to crises in nature is a system of rifts and shifts so it creates a rift and then then its solution um, shifts the problem elsewhere which in, inevitably creates a greater and greater rift. So I think the way that the ruling class and the way that capitalism will respond to, to climate breakdown is increasing nationalism, um, increasing militarism, you know, um, uh, with, through war, through warfare, through p different ruling classes around the world deciding that we, if there are limited resources, then we are going to fight for them and, and take them off somebody else. Um, and so that that is the way that capitalism and then the, it has always responded to crises in the past and based on that history i think it's quite likely that they will do so in the future so even though yes i guess a, a complete climate apocalypse will mean that there's no one no one can do business anymore capitalism is not as a system is incapable of, of, of thinking the long term it has to maintain uh, always has to focus on the short-term immediate short-term profit um so the only response we can we can expect from capitalist interests is to simply try to shift the problem elsewhere um, to, to make other people bear the bigger cost of a climate breakdown, usually people in the global south, for instance. Um, so I think that's what we can expect from, from, from the capitalists. Thanks, Simon. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for taking the time to join us today on the Green Dev Show. Um, I would like to remind you that if you like the work that we do, please become a Green Left supporter if you're not already. It's the best way to to uh, to both support our work and to get our content. But even without paying a single cent, you can support the work we do simply by giving a thumbs up to this video or this podcast, however you're listening to it. If you can make a, a, a review on Apple Podcasts, that would be helpful. Share the video, share the, the link on the Green Left Online. However you're, however you're uh, reaching this episode of the Green Left Show, please help us spread the word so we can help build the audience. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Thank <laughs> you.